Good morning and welcome to worship. It's the first Sunday in July. It's the first Sunday where we're having three services at APCH. The one you're watching now and two, of course, here in the sanctuary on Sunday morning. We hope that no matter where you are worshiping today, that you are blessed by hearing of God's word and singing together, uh, though quietly and perhaps into our masks. Uh, we pray for God's richest blessing on you uh, in this hour. And next week we will continue and do the same thing. We will have a service virtually and we will also meet together for two services, 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock next Sunday. We ask that if you know that you are coming that you would let us know and register so that we could plan accordingly. But if you wake up next Sunday morning and you say, let's go to church, please do come. You can register once you arrive and we'll know that you're here and we will all enjoy each other's presence together. Pastor Mark and I want to express our gratitude for the generosity in which uh, we've experienced this church to be over the last several months. Giving has remained strong and in such a challenging time, uh, this is unexpected, but it is such a testimony to the goodness of God and to the faithfulness of God's community. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Ministry continues and God's goodness and God's kingdom is being uh, furthered as we speak. And so uh, in no small part to your contributions. Thank you so much. As we've gathered in this place or wherever you are, to worship on this Sunday morning or whatever day you're watching. Let's pray together. Almighty and most holy God, we praise you this morning for the gift of another day. Your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O God. We pray that you would accept our praises that we bring, that Jesus, that you would perfect them before God the Father and that you would fill us with your spirit in such a way that no matter where we are today, whether it's the nine o'clock service or 11, or simply watching online, that you would unite us in the spirit around that same Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with God the Father. Accept the praises we bring, hear them. May they be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock, our redeemer, in whose name we pray. Amen.
Good day. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Genesis, selected verses from chapters 6, 7, and 8. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Make a roof of it, leaving below the roof an opening one cubit high all around. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant to you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you, two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and of every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for, for you and for them. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the floodwaters came on the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wives and his sons' wives entered the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Pairs of clean and unclean animals, of birds and of all creatures that move along the ground, male and female, came to Noah and entered the ark as God had commanded Noah. And after the seven days, the floodwaters came on the earth. For 40 days, the flood kept coming on the earth. And as the waters increased, they lifted the ark high above the earth. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth. And the ark floated on the surface of the water. They rose greatly on the earth and all the high mountains under and the entire heavens were covered. The waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than 50 cubits. Every living thing that moved on land perished, birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that sw swarm over the earth and all mankind, everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. People and animals and the creatures that move along the ground and the birds were wiped from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. The waters flooded the earth for 150 days. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark. And he sent a wind over the earth and the waters receded. Now the springs of the deep and the floodgates of the heavens had been closed and the rain had stopped falling from the sky. The water receded steadily from the earth. At the end of the 150 days, the water had gone down and on the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. So Noah came out together with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives, 
all the animals and all the creatures that move along the ground and all the birds, everything that moved on land came out of the ark, one kind after another. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on, on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's a joy to be with you again, APCH and those beyond. Let's pray. God, our creator and savior, lead us through your word in this wonderful story. Teach us about ourself, your world, and who we and you are in the midst of it. In your name we pray, amen. Last Sunday, we heard God tell us about that fatal taking and eating of the fruit of the one tree that Adam and Eve were forbidden to eat from in the Garden of Eden. On that day, you could say, all hell broke loose. Suffering, disease, violence, and all sorts of troubles. And things only got worse. We didn't read the earlier introduction to the story of Noah's Ark right at the beginning of chapter 6. But in that introduction, the sense is that within generations of Adam and Eve's rebellion against God, evil was now out of control. Corruption and violence are everywhere, as the message version of the Bible says it, the earth had become a sewer. To have a sense of what it is like today, perhaps you have to think of a situation like Yemen, widespread starvation, devastating violence, the collapse of a health care system, and complete social instability. Or even worse, think of the anarchy, corruption, and crises of Niger or of the Central African Republic, which make Yemen look bearable in comparison, or so many other places on the different continents in the earth. Things were so bad in Genesis that as chapter 6 begins, and as we heard, God's heart is lamenting the fact that he made humans. God is so distressed that he decides to wipe everything off the face of the earth, to make a clean sweep of life itself. There's one glimmer of hope. Noah. We heard the praiseworthy report at the beginning of today's reading and hearing. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Which, considering the complete breakdown of society all around Noah, is a wonder. You might ask, how could Noah, living in the midst of such a wicked, evil people, be such a beautiful person? He had no models of such goodness, and he himself had been born with the tendency of rebellion and self-centeredness that Adam and Eve now pass on to all of us. So how could Noah be so perfect? There's a clue. In the passage, just before our reading today, that first introduction to the story of Noah and the ark, 
after telling of the terrible situation that God was lamenting in the world, it says, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. But again, how can this be? Was he born perfect? Well, that can't be. And then you consider a word. Noah found favor in the eyes of the, of the Lord. And if you give that word a little bit of study, you'll find that that word is often translated differently in the Old Testament. The word that often translates it is grace. Noah found grace, the favor of God. In other words, before the reading that we heard, God's grace and favor were upon Noah. God, in spite of his disappointment and regret that he had made human beings, had elected Noah, chosen Noah along with his family to be God's source of salvation for the human race. God was gracious to Noah, had favor upon Noah, and Noah, in the passage we heard, was growing beautifully in that grace during his generation. And in his goodness and integrity, he walked with God, alert to the Creator's presence and voice. He, with his wife and family, will be the chosen people through whom God will save all of humanity. And trees, the wood of trees, will be their vessel. Noah, God said in verse 14 of chapter 6, make yourself an ark of cypress wood, as the New International Version translates it. Though if you had the New International Version Bible in front of you, you might see that there's a note there. The translators aren't sure what the translation of this Hebrew word should be when they translate it cypress. The word in Hebrew actually is three letters, G, F, R, gopher, which is how many of us grew up hearing the story, God saying to Noah, make yourself an ark of gopher wood, or gopher hout in the Dutch, which is why this message is titled, the gopher wood of our salvation. We just don't know what that word gopher means. No one knows of a gopher tree, though some of us have been pestered by gophers around trees. And this is the only reference to this type of wood in the Bible, making it impossible to explore further. Which is why most commentators and translators today assume that it's a tree with some resin in order to help withstand the water and a tree available to Noah, which results in a very common translation today, cypress wood, but with a note on the bottom saying we really aren't sure. From the tree of the cypress, or whatever tree was suitable for saving, make an ark, God says to Noah. And here's another interesting note. The Hebrew word here for ark is a word that is often translated chest. It's not so much necessarily a ship as something to preserve, something for safekeeping, whatever is within it. That's the focus of what God is calling Noah to make. It's quite rare in the Old Testament, too. It's not the same word that's used for the Ark of the Covenant, which is placed in the temple. But it is used one other time. It's the word used in Exodus 2 for the ark or chest or basket in which the infant Moses is placed by his mother. Two remarkable stories of God saving his people by placing his chosen ones in an ark, a chest for safekeeping from death, and for life. So Noah, favored by God, righteous, blameless among his contemporaries, and walking with the Creator, 
makes an ark. I had the joy as a father helping my 12-year-old son build a model ark for one of his classes when he was in school. We made it by two-by-fours. I'm not sure what the translation would be in the Netherlands, but long pieces of wood. We covered it with popsicle sticks to make it look like it had planks on the outside of it. And then we covered it with roofing tar. It was a fascinating gift for me to be able to help out and to learn how long the ark was compared to how high and wide it was. And we did quite well, actually. I think it was not the project I helped a son on who, when he brought the project home, came in with a smile on his face and said, Dad, look what grade you got for what you did. It wasn't my favorite event as a parent. Some of you, by the way, youth, children, you may find it this summer, something to explore. Check out the dimensions in the Bible of the ark and then draw it to scale or even try to make one, perhaps of Legos or something of the sort. Some of you certainly, too, saw the contemporary attempt to build a replica of the ark here in the Netherlands several years ago. It was docked in Dordrecht, I think, for a time. Is it now in Ipswich in the UK? Someone will tell me if it's otherwise. And into the ark, into this chest for safekeeping, went Noah and his family, and with them they took the animals two by two, and seven pairs of two by two for the clean animals that could be used for offering sacrifices to God and more. I wish I could show and tell you the whole children's picture book by Dutch artist Peter Speer. It's called Noah's Ark. It was one of our young children's favorite. It has almost no words, but wonderful drawings. It has koala bears clinging to elephants' legs as they headed toward the ark, and snakes and snails and raccoons trying to avoid the feet. The tigers are being pushed into the ark in a cage so that they won't get out and destroy the others. Noah is doing his best to pull a donkey with all his might to get him over the threshold, and the donkey is hee-hawing, hee-hawing with fear as he or she enters. Noah's wife is up on the table as soon as the mice come in. And on the way out, by the way, the two rabbits that entered have now become too many to count. And when the animals were all in, the doors were shut. And then it began to rain. It was a deluge of biblical proportions, the phrase we often use. For 40 days, the heavens opened up and poured all they had upon the earth, so that even the, the boundaries of the waters on earth were broken. And all the people and animals and birds were drowned that weren't in the ark. It was God's gift to preserve some with trees, with wood. God kept them. After 40 days, their floating in the ark was not ended. After 150 days, the waters had receded enough so that the ark came to rest, as the Bible says, on Mount Ararat. But it wasn't until a year after they had all entered the ark that they could finally go in outside on dry land. It was a whole new earth to them. A year it was, in that ark full of animals and all the things that come with animals. And you thought we have it bad to be social distancing for several months. People ask, did the flood cover the whole world? And some of your friends and colleagues and fellow students may think this is ridiculous, a myth. 
Christ-formed people have held different opinions about this for centuries. Some read the Bible as if it's a 20th century or 21st century newspaper account or a scientific report and say the flood covered Mount Everest and every other mountain on earth. Others will say that it was a, a terrible flood of local proportions that destroyed everything in the region around. Some say that we just don't understand what it really was. We can allow some diversity of opinion on this. What we want to hear is the significant word of God to us in this flood. And that is that God was profoundly disappointed in the evil and violence of the people he had made. An evil and violence that is in us naturally too, apart from Christ and his Spirit's work. And that God was not only a God of love, but a God of justice, who punishes evil. And that even more profoundly, God was a God of grace to Noah, who found grace or favor from the Lord and all the people after whose life God had saved through Noah and his family. And trees, which provided the wood for Noah's ark, were the vessel of God's deliverance. Thanks be to God for his gracious goodness and for the trees of his creation that saved us. It wouldn't be the last time that trees and the wood of trees saved people. If you read the Bible and take notes of all the trees there and the wood from trees, you'll see again and again how God uses trees and wood to save and bless people. Perhaps even now you can remember some of the stories in the Bible where wood or trees in one way or other were used by God. But of course, the tree for which there is no greater tree is the one on which Jesus the Messiah, God's Son, our Savior, died. We usually call it the cross, but God's people also know it as the tree. As Peter said in chapter 2 of his first letter, Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. In a profound sense, Noah and the trees, the gopher wood or cypress or whatever type it was, are a type of Christ on the cross. Though Jesus the Messiah is a savior infinitely more profound, beautiful, and transformative, in Noah, God gives us a hint, a pointer, to what Christ will do one day for all of his people and world. And the beams of the ark might look forward to the beams that would one day hold our Savior. For when the flood was finished and the family of Noah and the animals descended to earth from the ark, God knew that this wouldn't change the hearts of people. We would still, as God said, be naturally inclined toward all evil. But God vowed never to destroy the world again with a flood. The rainbow is God's sign to us of that promise. For God had a much greater plan to not only save the lives of people, but to make us a new creation in Jesus Christ and by God's Holy Spirit within us. Listen to some of the ways that Noah was a type of Christ, but only a hint of that glory and wonder. While Noah was righteous in his generation, and God saved him through the ark, we were unrighteous, enemies of God, along with our whole generation, and God saved us through the cross of Christ. And while Noah built with his own hands the vessels of this and his family's salvation, Christ was nailed to a tree made by others, and through him God saved the world. And while Noah and his family were saved physically through the wood of the ark, 
people would remain the same. But in Christ's death on the tree and resurrection life, the world was given the gift of salvation. Not only those after Christ, but before, were saved through him on the tree, on the cross. And to all who will believe, God gives us a new spiritual heart, a transformed way of seeing life, eternal salvation, and the gift of God's Spirit to make us increasingly the people God already declares us to be, his own children, new in Jesus. Noah's was an amazing story and work of God. Christ's was matchless. He says to you and me, believe in me and you will have eternal life now and forever. It's a matchless gift that Christ invites you and me to receive now or to delight in and give God praise and thanks for. And both acts of saving, Noah on the ark for a new beginning, Christ on the cross for a whole new reality and life, in both these works of salvation, God uses trees to play a critical role. Don't take them for granted. I've been wondering all week if trees, if they could think and talk, might feel a source of eternal pride and joy and think something like, some of our own provided the means to save human beings and animals from death and even more, one of our own held the world's Savior. And we are so deeply honored and grateful. Thank God for trees. And let the trees speak to you of the gifts of God of salvation and so much more. Knowing this, how do we live in, in a world that still is filled with violence and evil? Uh, sometimes it's like a sewer, it seems. Noah came off the ark and immediately with his family set up an altar and worshipped God. Those who experienced Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead fell down before him and worshipped. We, when we're able, sing for joy in thanksgiving and receive the, the sign and seal of Jesus' grace to us in the Lord's Supper. Worship is a, is a basic response of us for all of God's saving acts. I, I encourage you to do that in response to this service. When you're at home or in the car, turn on your favorite hymns and contemporary songs of praise and listen to them or sing with them to God in honor and delight. But also, in your worship, meditate upon the saving gift of God for you. Usually, we at APCH would celebrate the Lord's Supper today, but now for the safety of God's people, and because we can't all be together, we're not going to do that. We'll pray for the day when we can. It's so important in our lives. But while we can't do that today, I encourage you to sit with a glass of wine or of juice and some bread, the, the signs of the sacrament for us, do it with your family or with friends or perhaps by yourself and reflect on what this means that Jesus Christ died on the tree for our salvation, that his blood was shed, that his body was given for us and not only us, but for the whole church of all times and all places. Reflect on what this gift of Christ's forgiveness means for you, how it has changed your life and how you know it will change you continually. And then even if you can, tell your family or your friends a story or two of what this means. You could even begin by saying, in worship today, the message was about how God saves us and especially saves us in Christ. Let me tell you a story of how much I think this means in my life or a story of how this affected me so importantly. Worship. But secondly, you might also imagine that the love and grace of God in your own life are like an ark. That is, in a profound way, you are held within the care of God, under you, around you, over you, through all the storms of life, from the challenge of this pandemic 
to terrible times of disappointment or loss or challenge, through gifts of God's wonderful provision and goodness. Jesus Christ is with you and holds you in all things, like an ark, like a chest of protection for you. In one of the ancient writings, in the period between the Old and the New Testament, there is a phrase that says, Y-A, Yah, is the ark. It's shorthand for Yahweh, Jehovah, God, is the ark who holds and protects us, the sense is. Live today and tomorrow and beyond with that sense of security and future hope that surrounds you. And let it embolden you to live in this world trustingly, obediently, peacefully, boldly, and gratefully. And thirdly, like Noah and his family on the ark, know that God has promised after we are through this life, with all the storms around us, that God has promised a new heavens and a new earth when we'll step forth from this world into the new heavens, a brand new reality where there is no sickness or crying, no suffering or injustice, no unfairness or want. There all things will be made forever new. And we will rejoice with the church of all times and all places. And perhaps even Noah will tell us some stories about what it was like to be in that ark and how glad he and his wife and family were to be out that day. God bless you in the ark of God's care, in the forgiving gift of God's deliverance, and as well with the hope of of an eternal future. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's pray. God, our Creator, our Redeemer, our Savior, the one who cares for us through all of life and to the very end, give us joy in our hearts at your saving work through Christ. Give us hope for the future. And then we pray that we'll live trusting your care always, Lord God, you who are our ark, who are for us, our deliverance and care always. In your name we pray, amen.
daylight flees Now the ground beneath Quakes as its maker Bows his head Curtain torn in two Dead or raised to Let's pray together. God, our creator, preserver, savior, provider, we honor and worship you. Our hearts form an altar of praise. Your grace and wise plan saved us through Noah. Your patience and leading has kept us through millennia. Your infinite mercy and goodness gives us new life in Christ Jesus. We overflow in joy and gratitude. All glory to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Even as you preserved Noah and his family in the ark, grow our deep trust and courage in the ark of your care throughout this life, whatever storms or seasons of waiting that this world gives us. For those who need the ark of your care for physical conditions, we pray. For John Hrunwechen and Liz Eseromo and Hubert Rombly in their significant needs for healing and strength, we pray. And for their spouses and families, too, during this time. Hear our prayers in silence for them and for others dear to us who need your physical healing. For those who face other suffering and challenges in life, related to jobs or the loss of jobs, family tensions, emotional or spiritual struggles, and more, hear our silent prayers and be an ark of protection, healing, and hope for them. and for this congregation and other churches around the world that face the storms of life, the coronavirus, the loss of faith in the society around them that assaults them, internal divisions, or increasing persecution in parts of the world, 
For them we pray in silence and hope. Through all this, grow in us the hope of the new heavens and the new earth, without suffering and disease, full of justice and shalom for people of all races and languages, cultures and continents. And let us, who are your servants, Lord Jesus, and of your kingdom, plant signs of that eternal life in which we already live in you. And so, hear us as we pray together for all of life in the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As you go out in this week, or as you stay at home, whatever the case may be, God's calling in your life. God go before you to lead you. God go behind you to protect you. God go beneath you to support you. God go beside you to befriend you. Do not be afraid. And the blessing of God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you. Do not be afraid. Go in peace and be at peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.